Well, thank you very much for having me here. What I'm going to do now is to show you just a couple of slides to support my main argument. And this argument would be that most of the <laughs> ethical concerns we have regarding genetic, genomic, and molecular technologies are unfounded and stem from just misunderstanding of the science. I'm not a philosopher or, or a rabbi. I'm a scientist and I'm going to talk about how I understand science today in this respect and also point out to some facts that are um, well accepted as the general understanding that we have today about our genomes and our gene and their, and their connection to our traits. So uh, if you remember about a decade ago, we started discussing the Human Genome Project and when uh, pe people who deal with politics of science attempted to convince the Congress to support this enterprise, you could hear expressions such as revealing the blueprint of life. The understanding was that once we decipher the chemical composition of our genome, we will under understand all there is to understand about the blueprint of, of individuals, how they build and how they operate. Now, one of the major revolutions that the Genome Project brought about was connected merely to the understanding that we are so far away from understanding anything about life. The attempt was to identify our genes. Let me begin with a simple fact. You know, the favorite to toy of molecular biologists is this bacteria. It's called E. coli. It has 5,000 genes. We have more complex organ organisms like the this fly, the fruit fly, it has 14,000 genes. If we grow in complexity further, we get to this little animal, the C. elegans. This is uh, uh, an organism that is uh, the favorite of brain researchers and researchers of development because it's a very simple organism with just 1,000 cells. It has 20,000 genes. Now we go to a far more complex organism, that's Homo sapiens, <laughs> and this organism has only 26,000 genes. In fact, today people say not 26, not 26, maybe 22. Is there anything more complex than human, be than, uh, human being? Well, yeah, corn, 60,000. <laughs> So, does corn know something we don't? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, but the general understanding, when I was a freshman, our textbooks and our professors said that a human being has 100,000 genes, and that was not so long ago. This is the main outcome of the, of the Human Genome Project. So some people say today, well, maybe corn is more complex than a human being. Our intuition is that this is not true. And what science understands today is that if we look at complexity in other terms, for example, we look at the elements in DNA that are not genes. And we know that in different organisms, there are part of the DNA that are not genes. We don't know what they are, People used to call them junk DNA. Today we know that they are not junk, but we don't know anything positive about them. Well, we have some clues recently. But if you look at the amount of non-coding DNA, all of a sudden you see that somehow it corresponds to our intuition about complexity. You see that uh, organisms that we perceive as more complex have more of this stuff that we don't know what it is. Another insight that was a result of, 
of this finding is that biology should deal more with these kind of maps. This hairball that you see here is a map that represents the interaction between genes and proteins in the cell. So people say today that this is more of the blueprint than the list of genes. And indeed, our findings today are that the complexity of this map also correlates more to our intuition of which organism is more complex than the other. So we know now, and this is a new emerging field in biology, and it's called systems biology, and this field says it's important to deal with the characteristics of individual genes and individual proteins. But we can't get a true picture of biology with, without studying this mess. This is the basic message of this new field of systems biology. Let me give you one example that has to do with drugs. About 20 years ago, people found a new molecule, a new protein that was not known before. It's called leptin. Leptin is secreted by fat cells and then circulates in the blood, goes to the brain, and controls appetite. You know, drug companies said, wow, this is the, big, the next bonanza. We are going to sell this as a drug against obesity. People will just take the drug and lose appetite. And indeed, when you give this protein to mice, what you see is that they starve. You put them in a cage with anything they like to eat, and you just give them this molecule, and they starve to death because they're not hungry. But what happened when they tried to give it to people? <coughs> they still preferred chocolate. <laughs> Why did it happen? Well, we have many genes that control the appetite. And what this drug does, it presses one button that affects another button in the brain. In the brain. What we didn't know is that we have a very complex network. And if you press one button that affects another element in the network, you still didn't block many other pathways that exist. This goes back to the basic understanding that this view of biology, here you see one protein bound to the DNA, which is the traditional view of biology that most students of biology see today, is only part of the story. We need to go back to the hairballs. Why do I tell you this? I tell you this because our understanding that a certain gene is connected to a certain disease is always partial. There are very, very, very few cases in which we know that there is a very deterministic relationship between a mutation in one gene and the phenotype, meaning the measurable trait, in the whole creature, in the organism, when it behaves in the world. Now, when people talk about technologies such as the technology we discuss today, they mostly think that we find one element in the car that causes all the problems. But you know in your car, which is far, far less complex than any organism we know, you know that sometimes you go to, to the garage and the mechanic uh, um, um, tells you, well, there's problem with this and that. You don't know what this pa part of, of your car does. <coughs> he knows. And even if he's honest, sometimes he changes this part and the problem is not fixed. So you say, oh, yeah, he's going to, to pull my leg again. He's going to make, make me pay extra. Some, sometimes he does that. But sometimes it's his best judgment. It's the right judgment. But the car is far more complex than even the mechanic can tell. Obviously, when you try to tinker with your car, you usually destroy more than you help. And this is also definitely the case with our current understanding of biology. Now, I think you might have heard about personalized medicine, the idea that we can look at the genome of an individual, see what kind of differences this individual has with respect to other individuals, and tell that individual what treatment 
he needs to get. And it's often very true. But we don't understand the complexity of it. This is a map of a basic process that is connected to cancer. And we know the problems here in, these, in this branch of the process can cause cancer. People tried to use it as a way to determine, based on the genes of individuals, whether they are going to have this type of cancer or not. Only later on, people discovered that there is a bypass here, a detour. The information can come through this route if this route is blocked. And we still don't know how to compute this. I have several graduate students that are trying to develop computational frameworks to tell us what happens even in this small system that has just a dozen of <coughs> genes to tell us what happens if there are two mutations. If there are two mutations here, we can't know how to sum their effect on the organism. Now, we all know that in the genome of each of us, there are many mutations that are very severe, mutations that can cause terrible diseases. But the combination of these mutations makes make them uh, less severe or less effective. And we don't know what specific combination will cause the disease. So just one last example. You know this guy? It's Steven Pinker, the known uh, linguist and psychologist from MIT. A couple of months ago, he had his genome sequenced. And he published a piece, a, a very nice piece in the New York Times where he pointed to the fact, for example, that they found in his gene a gene that, a version of a gene that almost every man that carries this version of the gene is bold. And this is what Steven Pinker looks like. <laughs> now, if we turn to these technologies and we say, well, if, I, if, if a bald head is a, is a terrible disease and I want to make sure that the embryo does not carry the mutation, I would get rid of whoever wants to do this will get rid of Steven Pinker before he was born. Now, you can argue whether it would be good or bad for humanity, but definitely he's not bold and he's over 60. So just to sum up, there are cases in which we know very clearly that one mutation is tightly connected to a terrible disease such as Tay-Sachs. And we know that even in, in, you know, in, in Halakha, most of the poskim would say that if an embryo carries this mutation, it is, it is justified some poskim, and Tzitz Eliezer, Rav Waldenberg, says that you have to abort this kind of, chi of child. There are cases, most of the cases, are far, far, far more complex. So in, in uh, the introduction to this session, the, the disease, Huntington's disease was mentioned. This is a disease with late onset. We know that the mutation causes it one to one. We don't know 40 years from now what would be our ability to deal with the mutation. BRCA is another example that is mentioned. This is a mutation in one gene. There are actually two genes that have this trait. A woman that carries this mutation has 80% chance of developing breast cancer and 40% chance of developing uh, ovarian cancer. And in fact, it's certain that in this room, because there are so many Jews here, there are carriers of this mutation. And a man could be a carrier of this mutation too. The idea of saying these people should not be born, I'm not talking about the moral aspects of this. I'm talking just about the genomic aspects of this. You're choosing <coughs> one embryo to put back in the womb because you know it doesn't have this mutation. But I can tell you for certain it has other mutations we are not aware of that could be even more detrimental. So the choice of one, one mutation that we know over another that we don't know is what we call in Hebrew just looking for the coin where there is light and not where you lost it. So when we talk about using our genetic and genomic understanding in order to devise new reproductive technologies, we have to bear in mind just one fact. The main lesson that we, ha we have from the last decade or so of genomic research 
is that we know almost nothing. Thank you.